So what are some of these locally acting mediators? Well, one that's uh, very interesting is histamine, which is stored in mast cells and enterochromaffin cells and in neurons, and in neurons. Bradykinin, serotonin. You thought serotonin was a neurotransmitter, didn't you? Its main role in the body is an inflammatory mediator. Tachykinins, you probably heard of substance P for pain, substance P for pain. And then one called palmitoyl ethanolamide, PEA, which is a, a local injury antagonist. So here's how this works. Here is a mast cell full of all these mediators. It's got IgE specific to a certain antigen on its cell surface. If that, now this says drug antigen, but this could be bee pollen, could be anything the person is sensitive to. Uh, what it does is it cross-links these IgEs, and when those IgEs are cross-linked, that causes a conformational shift in pro transmembrane proteins. And that conformational shift, I think, you know, it's like a little dance that's going on inside of the cell. Suddenly these proteins are doing this thing, right? And it's like a handoff. And that handoff leads to the assembly of microtubules inside the cell. So the microtubules line up and form this pathway that tells the mast cell, open up, dude, spit it out. And they gush. They go, yeah. You don't want your mast cells throwing up, do you? I've experienced that. It's not fun. It's called hives. Right? Or it's called nasal congestion. Or it's called Wheezing. This is because the mast cells are releasing the histamines, among other things. There's a list of 15 chemicals that are coming out of these granules in the mast cell. So histamine, a very, very interesting compound derived from the amino acid histidine, made in all tissues in the body, concentrated in body surfaces, but especially in mast cells and basophils. What's the difference in mast cells and basophils? Mast cells are sessile, so mast cells are confined to tissues like the skin, the mucous membrane, and basophils are in circulation. But otherwise, they're the same cells, and they do the same thing, which is they release histamine. And what turns on that histamine production? Complement split products, we talked about that. Uh, IgE ligands, that's important because that requires prior exposure. A person isn't born with an allergy to bee venom, right? They have to acquire that. So the mast cells kind of span the bridge between innate immunity and acquired immunity. And then there's environmental stressors that can do it. You probably all know someone that can write their hand, write their name on their arm or their hand, and they'll get a little hive from that. It's called dermatographia. You know about dermatographia, right? I have a, a dermatology textbook that's got a picture of somebody's forearm, and they've written hives. <laughs> hives. That's histamine, right? So that's a direct mechanical stimulation of the mast cell to make this happen. Now, something that's relatively new, I mean, not brand new, but relatively new is our understanding is that there's histamine in food. Spoiled fish can have a lot of it. And if you eat spoiled fish, you can get something called scombroid poisoning, which people that live in Florida know all about because you can get it from grouper. If the fish sits on a warm dock for too long, then it fills up with histamine and causes a problem. But there are a lot of foods that naturally have histamine in them, especially sake and sausage and sauerkraut. So people that are super sensitive to histamine will eat these foods, and it looks like they're having an allergic reaction. Right? They can get flushing. They can get diarrhea. Um, and so they either need to get a list of those foods and learn about them, or they can use an, an enzyme called DAO, diamine oxidase, that actually breaks down the histamine inside their body. And that's, a, that's got some pretty good science behind it. So the type of response you get to histamine 
depends on the cell where the histamine is landing. If we're talking about the mucous membranes, the histamine bonds to H1 receptors and causes sneezing, hachoo, mucus sneezing, hachoo, wheezing, <gasps> all of those things are a result of binding to H1 receptors. Okay? And, of course, this is what it looks like, and we all know about anti- histamines as a drug class. But this is the perfect example of what I'm talking about with downstream, right? When you use an antihistamine, the histamine has already been released. It's already there. So it's going to have its effects, and the best you can do is try to block it a little bit. But unfortunately, there isn't really an antihistamine out there that doesn't have some degree of side effects, especially uh, lethargy and fatigue, right? So that's downstream is using an antihistamine. Upstream is using something that would keep the histamine from being released in the first place, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Of course, we got H2 receptors in the gut, and that causes gastric acid production. Now, you might know about a class of drugs called tricyclic antidepressants, like imipramine, uh, amitriptyline. Did you know that those drugs were originally developed as antihistamines? That I have a friend that works for NIH. He's a researcher in NIH that told me this story, that when they were initially researching those drugs, they had, were looking at the structure, and they said, oh, th these will be antihistaminergic. And so they were giving them to people in a clinical trial, and people came back and said, gee, my depression has gone away. My mood is better. Nobody would have thought that there was all this overlap between a neurotransmitter and an inflammatory mediator. But it turns out that when you use these antihistamines, people's moods get better. And that is because histamine is also a neurotransmitter, just like serotonin is a neurotransmitter and an inflammatory mediator. Substance P is an inflammatory mediator and a neurotransmitter. So what happens if you have too much histamine in the brain? It's acting as a neurotransmitter and makes the person anxious. Makes the person anxious. And that's why we sometimes use uh, hydroxyzine, for example, an antihistamine as an anti-anxiety agent. Isn't that cool? If you think about it, that kind of overlap is really pretty unique in nature. So how do we go upstream? Well, there turns out to be an agent called quercetin, which is a pigment that's found in onions and apples. In fact, most fruits and vegetables have some degree of this yellow pigment. And if you concentrate, normally we're eating, if we eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, we're probably getting less than 100 milligrams a day. If you increase that by a factor of at least 10 to 20 and start giving people 1,000 to 3,000 a day, that quercetin acts as a mast cell stabilizer. It prevents the release of histamine. And this is one of the first kind of natural agents that I started using in my practice almost 40 years ago. And I've continued to use it with great success for a wide range of, of allergies, but also for mood disorders, for just about any situation where excessive histamine might be a problem. It's very safe to use. It's generally well tolerated. Um, so I recommend it even for little kids. Other local acting inflammatory mediators. Well, there's eicosanoids, which we're going to talk about in some detail, platelet activating factor, nitric oxide, which we used to think was an inert gas, um, but now we know can either be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, depending on the context, and then a chemical called endothelins. I'm just giving you this list. I'm not asking you to memorize this. You're not going to be tested on this, but I want you to get a sense of how many mediators there are. Sometimes people think, oh, it's histamine, uh, it's eicosanoids, and that's kind of the end of the story. But there's a long list, and as my Maimonides would have been happy to say, there are many more to come. There are many more to come. So 
you know, and I'm sure the drug companies will be on top of it. How do we know about these things? Because drug companies discover them and then come up with the drug. Am I right about that? That's how you know that there's some, you know, if some new pathway has been discovered, you start getting things in the mail. There's conferences. Doctor, did you know about endothelins? Like, no, I didn't. Well, you should know about endothelins. We're having a big conference on it. And I go, what's the drug? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just how, you know, they, you don't sponsor an entire conference on a particular substance unless there's a payback, unless there's some drug in the works. Oh, yum. How many of you had sardines for breakfast? So <laughs> what's so great about sardines? It's, you ever been camping with somebody that brought a can of sardines? Like, not in the tent, please. <laughs> not in the tent. So this is an interesting story. It's an interesting story because we're talking about a scenario where things that you eat are precursors to inflammatory mediators. I already said that with histamine and histidine, which is an amino acid that's found in food. But this is even more direct of relationship. So if you're eating certain foods, it's going to influence the precursors to these signaling molecules called eicosanoids. And how do we make these eicosanoids? We oxidize 20 chain, uh, 20 carbon long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we make these eicosanoids on the spot. They're not hanging out in the bloodstream. The polyunsaturated fats, the omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids, they're in the membranes of leukocytes. So they're hanging out in the leukocytes, and they're kind of locked and loaded. They're ready to go. And then the trigger comes along, activates an enzyme called phospholipase A2, and that liberates the fatty acid from the membrane, and then it's acted upon by certain enzymes that will oxidize it and turn it into these eicosanoids. So what I'm saying is, here is this scenario, these chemicals that our bodies are using all of the time that are heavily influenced by what we eat. Heavily influenced by what we eat. By whether we eat sardines for breakfast, or we're more likely to have steak and eggs, which is going to create an entirely different physiological profile. Now, these eicosanoids are involved in tumor, rubor, dolor, and calor, right? So all aspects of the inflammatory reaction are mediated by these chemicals. So, I mean, I have to ask you, if, if, this is, if you knew this is what's causing muscle cramps, as in menstrual cramps, in fact, that's how these chemicals were first discovered, by trying to understand the physiology of menstrual cramps. Right? They, they discovered them in the prostate, so they were called prostaglandins, right? But then immediately people recognized that this is what was causing menstrual cramps, and that's one of the first uses for non anti-inflammatory drugs. So we can block these chemicals and stop menstrual cramps. Long before using it for arthritis or every inflammatory condition under the sun, it was all about menstrual cramps, because these things modulate smooth muscle tone. They also modulate vascular rheology. In other words, they influence clotting tendencies. They also uh, influence nerve transmission and mood. So we keep hearing this overlap, don't we, between inflammation and the inflammatory process and mood. And there's one theory that says mood disorders are caused by deficiencies or imbalances of neurotransmitters. There's an emerging perspective on mood disorders that says bad moods are caused by inflammation or disruptions in the inflammatory cascade, which takes you down a whole different pathway or it takes you upstream in a whole different pathway, does it not? And finally, we know about using fish oil to lower triglycerides. How does that work? 
works through production of metabolites of the fish oil that bind to something called PPAR, peroxisome proliferated activated receptor. Can you say that five times really fast? Yes. So we know, we know the phenomenon because the FDA has approved fish oil. Doesn't that make you excited? Makes me feel much more comfortable. You know? So now you can go down to your local Walgreens and get a big box of fish and your insurance company will pay for it. Just kidding. So these are polyunsaturated fats. And what's unique about polyunsaturated fats is that they have a three-dimensional structure, correct? They have a three-dimensional structure because they have these double bonds. So every, if you've got a saturated fat, the saturated fats stack up on top of each other. And that's why they're super, um, they, they tend to get hard at room temperature, like lard. Whereas a polyunsaturated fat has got kinks in it from those double bonds. Now, the location of the double bond has some influence on how the body's going to respond to these fats. So, and quote, omega-3 fatty acid has got its double bond three carbons down from the terminal. So it's got its kink three carbons down. The omega-6 has got its six carbons down from the terminal. So, you know, you're going to have this kind of curve or this kind of curve. And nature's all about structure. So we know that there are two basic groups of these precursor long-chain fatty acids. We know there's the anti-inflammatory, and this is not all hard and fast, but it's kind of a general rule. The anti-inflammatory omega-6 uh, of, called DGLA, made from gamma-linolenic acid, the omega-3 eicosapentaenoic acid, dicosahexaenoic acid, and then the pro-inflammatory arachidonic acid. What I'm telling you is that the reason that they're pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory has to do with this molecular structure, right? How does that bind to receptors on the enzymes that are going to convert these fats into certain eicosanoids? And it's the shape of the eicosanoid that's going to make it inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. You with me on that? So you got one shape that's like, you know, ready to go. That's inflammatory. And another one's like. So here's your omega-3. So take that home with you, omega-3s. I've got a nice anti-inflammatory molecular structure. Two major groups of enzymes that produce eicosanoids. Um, the COX enzyme producing prostanoids and the LOX enzyme producing leukotrienes. And we've got a drug for that, don't we? We've got a drug for that. Now, which eicosanoids are you going to make? It depends on the tissue. So platelets only have one enzyme. They have the COX-1 enzyme, um, and they're going to make an eicosanoid called thromboxane A2. Right? Because they're limited by that enzyme. So every cell has got its own little mix of those enzymes, and every cell has a slightly different output of the eicosanoid. So every cell participates in this inflammatory process in a slightly different way. So here's our nice, neat little pattern. This is what we're thinking is the solution to inflammation. And the idea is that we have two different types of COX enzymes that make prostanoids. We have a constitutive COX enzyme, COX-1, and depending on the cell type, like platelets, it can make thromboxane A2 or prostaglandin E2 in the kidney. So we call this the housekeeper. This is the housekeeper enzyme because it maintains daily functions in the body and... We need those for the organs to be healthy. On the other hand, we have COX-2, which is an induced enzyme. It's induced as an inflammatory trigger. So there's exposure to a pathogen or there's injury. COX-2 gets activated, and then it produces inflammatory mediators and prostaglandins. So here's our nice little theory, if that's the case. Why don't we come up with drugs that are selective for COX-2? 
And we all know where that story went, don't we? When I first started giving this lecture, um, it was kind of before those drugs became popular. And people were saying, Bob, why this is so esoteric. Why are you talking about these in this is so as a this Cox one, Cox two, like who cares? You know, give people NSAIDs. Well, I mean the whole issue is you give people aspirin or ibuprofen and it blocks Cox one and Cox two. Right? It's non selective. And that means you burn a hole in the person's stomach. You take ibuprofen or naproxen every day, you burn a hole in your stomach, or you cause kidney damage. So the idea was great. Let's get selective. And those drugs became some of the top-selling drugs in the world. It it became known as the billion-dollar pathway. The billion-dollar pathway, because these drugs were so popular. And where are they now? I think I have two patients on celecoxib now. Two patients. They're holdovers. I didn't prescribe it originally. They don't want to quit. But I never initiate therapy for people with COX-2 inhibitors. Do you? I mean, do you? Does anyone? So we, you know, we saw in the course of teaching this course over the years, we saw that rise and fall. We saw the, these drugs get really popular way downstream. That's way downstream, isn't it? Way downstream, super popular. And then, boom, they collapsed when we began to realize there was an increased incidence of heart attacks in people that took COX-2 inhibitors. And why is that? Because it turns out COX-2 is a useful enzyme. If we're blocking it all the time, every day, you're going to create problems. So we think we have a solution. We weren't listening to Maimonides. We got all excited. Billions of dollars were made, and then billions of dollars in lawsuits were paid out. That's kind of how it goes in this scenario. But why not work upstream? If you work upstream, then you're talking about changing a person's diet. You can give them omega-3 fatty acids, the 18 carbon from plant. You don't get longer chains from plants, only 18 carbons. Flax, walnut, chia, and canola, or 20 carbon from fish and wild game, or or omega-3 eggs, or omega-6. Again, some people have thought omega-6 is bad, omega-3 is good. It's not like that. It's um, arachidonic acid is more pro-inflammatory, and it's a certain type of omega-6. But there's certain omega-6s that are beneficial. GLA is beneficial. And that's why you're going to be tested on this diagram. Uh, you should sleep with it under your pillow tonight. What this diagram shows, and you do have a copy of this, is that the omega-3 family and omega-6 family, these 18, starting with 18 carbons, they're all metabolized by the same enzymes, right? So they're working in parallel. And what that means is that they're competing with each other. They're competing with each other. So if you, and generally most people tend to have an excessive amount of the omega-6 in general and not much omega-3. And so when you add more omega-3 to the diet, you're creating balance. Are you with me on that? That's what we're going for. We're not saying one is bad, one is good. We're saying we want to see more balance, and we have an imbalance in our diet between the omega-3 and the omega-6. So we want to increase the omega-3s, and when we do that, we end up with more of this 20-carbon long-chain fatty acid called EPA, which makes less inflammatory eicosanoids. So that's about a three-hour lecture in three minutes. Um, but I hope you get the idea. How do we apply this in clinical practice? Well, we can actually do, there's two things that I do commonly. You can look at the ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA, okay? And you measure that in plasma or whole blood. Whole blood is a better way to go. This is a marker for eicosanoid balance, cellular inflammation. The ideal range is for a ratio less than three. So you want three times as much EPA as arachidonic acid. That's not that common, especially if people are on paleo diets. They're going to get a lot of arachidonic acid. And I see a fair number of people in this range of 7 to 15, so their risk is high. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying arachidonic acid is bad. 
there's certain things about it that are good. It's a precursor for anandamide, which is the feel-good chemical. So there, there, and there's, it's a precursor to chemicals that turn off inflammation. So it's not all bad. It's the ratio that's really the issue. An even more useful index was, was developed by Dr. William Harris. It's measured in red cell fatty acids. I think he uses, the lab uses a whole blood spot. So blood spot is, is basically, it's whole blood. They call it RBC fatty acids, but they're really looking at whole blood. And that's more like a tissue biopsy. Right? The, the fatty acids, omega-3 fat that you get in circulation in your serum reflects your last meal. So if you're eating a consistent diet, that's fine. But what if you had tacos the night before and you hadn't had tacos in years? Fish tacos, I should say. <laughs> well, or if you had, you know, if you had pork tacos the night before, you're going to have more arachidonic acid. If you had fish tacos, you're going to have more EPA. Are you with me on that? Okay. So this is a pretty good biomarker for coronary heart disease mortality. You want to have an index of greater than 8%. So here's an example. This is a patient of mine, 59-year-old white female with multiple sclerosis. She's taking an EPA supplement, she takes fish oil, but she's also on a paleo diet, right? So she eats a lot of meat, she avoids gluten, she doesn't eat grains, right? So she's a heavy meat diet, and what we see is that the fish oil is not making up for all the meat that she's eating. So her omega-3, and her arachidonic acid, the EPA, is pretty high, it's at 15, Right? And her omega-3 index is 3.8. I'd like to see that around 8. Are you with me on that? Okay. Bottom line is that it's generally a useful thing to give people omega-3 fatty acids as part of your intervention for a wide range of inflammatory conditions. Allergy, autoimmune disease, heart disease, kidney disease, neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, mood disorders, menstrual cramps, loss of weight with cancer treatment, all of these things are somewhat amenable to treatment with fish oil. And, and I'm just touching on the tip of the iceberg, but I hope I've given you a little bit of an understanding why that might be the case. Does that make sense? Okay, it's not a knee-jerk thing. It's just creating a healthy foundation for the immune system to respond in a proper way. Are you with me on that? 